This is Duke University. All right, while President Uribe is getting microphone, um, I'd just like to welcome everybody here this afternoon. Uh, on behalf of LASA, our Latin American Student Association, Dave invited President Uribe to, to speak here today. And um, I wanted to point out that this is part of the LASA Symposium. So this is the fourth annual symposium that they have, and the symposium is going to continue next Wednesday. Um, they haven't scheduled up behind me, but I guess it's off now. But next Wednesday, um, a week from this Wednesday, um, there'll be more of, of a continuing of the program. So at this point, um, I'd like to thank um, President Uribe for coming today. It's an honor to have him here. Um, got to speak to him earlier, with him earlier today, and um, he's very engaging. So um, you, you guys should should be excited for a, a great talk this afternoon. Um, in talking with him, he readily admits he has supporters and detractors, and that we may have both out here today. And unlike a lot of politicians. He is very open to taking questions from everybody today. So um, he's going to take some questions um, either throughout at your choice or at the end. And we've got till about 6.30 or so to go with this. Um, I'd like to invite a couple of our LASA students to come up and more formally introduce um, President Uribe, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're very excited to kick off the fourth Latin American Business Symposium, the role of business in an emerging Latin America. It is with great honor that we welcome Mr. Uribe, the 39th president of Colombia. And we're, very, we're sure that the pres uh, President Uribe's inspiring speech will initiate a discussion that will continue through next Wednesday when we're welcoming other political and business leaders to our symposium. Mr. Alvaro Uribe was the president of Colombia for two consecutive periods during which he maintained the highest approval rating in the history, averaging 72%. Mr. Uribe transformed Colombia, basing the structure of his government in three theses, democratic security, confidence for investors, and social cohesion. His coherence Hard work, hard work, and hard work, <laughs> inspiring, inspiring leadership and management style yielded unprecedented progress in the well-being of citizens of Colombia and in the positioning of the country to compete in the international sphere. President Uribe returned hope to my country and we will always be grateful for this. We are very proud of sharing this story with you today. Please join me welcoming Mr. Alvaro Uribe Vélez. Dean, Associate Dean, dear students, faculty members, I am very honored to be this evening with you. This is a great university, and we are very proud that uh, many Colombians and many Latin American students can share this opportunity with many students from the United States and from different countries. I understand your high academic level, for I want not to deliver a speech to you. I want to take advantage from this opportunity to receive your questions, your comments, and to do my best in answering them with uh, all my feelings. One very short introduction. Colombia has been a country of solid independent institutions. 
hard along the democracy in Latin America. In the last century, we suffered only four years of democratic interruption. My country never defaulted. Colombia never suffered hyperinflation. Colombia has always honored contracts. For one day ask, I ask to myself, with all these positive elements, why my country is having this low investment rate, this high unemployment rate, this high level of poverty, misery, and uh, for we propose to my fellow Colombians what I call the triangle of confidence the combination of security, but not a dictatorial security, security with democratic values. At the same time, investment, not as an end, investment as a mean to create resources for social cohesion, disease, education, health, and so on, that at the end, is the reason of politics and is the validation of security and investment. The combination of, three, of these three elements is what I call the triangle of confidence, plus one additional element, the balance between representative democracy and participative democracy. And we began to work. In the 19th century, Colombia enjoyed only seven years of peace. The last uh, formal civil war ended in the year 1902. But the country was left so depressed that one year after, Panama, the jewel of the crowd, of the crowd, of the crown, became independent. We had uh, more or less 40 years of relative peace. But between the beginning of the 40s and the year 1958, we suffered again violent confrontations between the two main historic political parties. At the moment the leaders signed a peace agreement, it coincided with the victory of the Cuban Revolution. Remember that Castro got in the streets of La Habana at midnight in between 1958 and 1959. And Castro chose two countries in South America to replicate the Cuban Revolution, Colombia and Bolivia. From that moment on, my country began to suffer Marxist-oriented guerrillas violence. Years later, it uh, showed up the paramilitary reaction with the same brutality. At the same time, narco trafficking was growing. And finally, narco trafficking co opted both, co opted leftist Marxist oriented guerrillas and leftist and rightist paramilitary violent groups. This is the situation our government found in the year 2002. Did we solve all the problems? No. I have never 
try to say that Colombia was converted into a paradise at the end of our administration. The only thing we did was to let the country, in my opinion, on the right track. With this introduction, it is much better to take this generous time, and I want to thank the university again, and to thank the students again for this kind of invitation, to take, opportunity, to take this opportunity for the possibility, possibility of exchanging views with you, beginning with your questions and comments. Ustedes escogieron algunos para que pregunten. Some of you have been assigned to ask questions. <laughs> because I, I said to the associate dean, to the ambassador, and to the dean and to the student, please assign question, assign those wanting to, to ask questions, assign for them the possibility to do it. I, I just want to ask you a quick question. Only, right? only one request. Yes. <laughs> Speak to me slowly. Yes. Because I am almost deaf. <laughs> and this is a limitation for being a singer. <laughs> but it is very important for being a politician. <laughs> I do agree with you about what you just say about your presidency, the two terms you have in Colombia. I, I'm also from Colombia. I'm, I am from Medellin, as, as Del Corral is. Then why, after eight years of going in the right track, if we agree that we were in the right track, now we have two years in which the institutions seems to be a, in, in a stop mode. And now we are getting back into a situation that precedes your presidency in 2002, in which we are trying to start a, pass, a peace treaty with a guerrilla that has more tied to narco traffic than any other political means. Why Colombia doesn't develop a model in which you can have the right track by law, instead of waiting to see who is in charge of the presidency and start moving the country back and forth in situation that doesn't allow a stability for long-term development? That will be my question. It is quite difficult. <laughs> because to answer this question, I have to get in now a day's politics in my country. And I am very critical. Two weeks ago, a group of ladies told me, Alvaro, why, what are you so critical if our country is doing well? And my answer was, there is a similarity between medicine and politics. Sometimes, we believe that we are fine. But we see some medical doctor. We find him by chance, and we greet him, and he looks at us. Oh, you are sick. No, no, I am very fine. No, you are sick. I see this problem in your eyes. Medicines, medical doctors have to be preventive. Politicians have to be preventive. This is uh, the main reason for me to be critical at this moment. In my opinion, during the last two years, the new administration that was elected under our platform has placed much more emphasis on negotiating with the terrorist group FARC than on, continue, on giving continuity to security. During our eight years, FARC came down from 
30,000 members to 6,800. If the, our policy would have given continuity, today FARC would have no more than 2,000 members. However, in accordance with the Minister of Defense, at this moment, FAR has more than 8,000. And the decrease of FARC was not a question of killing them. It was a question of pressing them for them to demobilize, to reinsert to the constitutional life. Indeed, during our administration, once we consolidate FARC, ELN, and paramilitaries, there was a demobilization of 53 members of the terrorist groups. We received them with generosity, but without impunity. We shortened sentences for them, but we did not give them, grant them, amnesty or pardon in the case of atrocities. Of course, there has been a relapse in crimes. 7% of the reinserted have relapsed in crimes. And it is no surprise. When you look at every peace process in the world, you see uh, some level of relapse in criminality. But it is necessary to, as you are generous with those fulfilling their obligations, you have to be very hard, very clear with those who relapse in crimes. I disagree with the offers of President Santos to give impunity to FARC or to ELN, or to any criminal organization. I have been asked, OK, but it is necessary to have a balance between peace and justice. And I have, yes, OK. In the name of, of peace, it is necessary to shorten, to shorten sentences. In some cases, to give parole. But it is different than to granting impunity. At the same time, I disagree with the idea that those involved in extortion, in kidnapping, in narco-trafficking, be considered politically eligible. Why? When we compare the Colombian situation with many cases in Central American countries, we find that in Central American countries, guerrillas uh, were granted uh, all the political rights. But there, is a, there are huge differences. Those guerrillas were political guerrillas. Ours are narco-traffickers. In uh, Central American countries, there were cases of governments with uh, democratic restrictions, or quasi-dictatorial governments. In Colombia, we have had a very open democracy, pluralistic democracy. Everyone agrees with peace. I agree. My generation has not lived one single day of peace. We need peace. But impunity is not the right way for any country to get peace. Discussing with some youth, are you? Two weeks ago, I was said, former president, you are wrong. If we sign an agreement with FARC, it does not matter, impunity. What does matter is peace. And I said to them, Pay attention. When you get profits without principles, 
at any moment, the lack of principles will reduce your profits. Without principles, it is possible that you are going to be run out of profits. Today, my government gives impunity to FARC. Tomorrow, a new criminal organization, and there are other criminal organizations, will ask for the same. And for us to have a lasting peace, we need the balance between justice and peace, but not impunity. These are some of the reasons of my criticism to the current situation. And of course, uh, many people at this moment, they say, OK, we want peace. But we are doubtful. And we need to stop our projects in Colombia. Domestic investors and foreign investors at this moment, they, they have to stop and to look. Wait and look. I disagree with the possibility of creating doubts on the country to the investors community. Because our country is a country of 47 million people, the third largest population in Latin America, after Brazil and Mexico. We still have over 32% of poverty. Our unemployment rate is in between 9 and 10. We need a, a long way to go. And without invest, investment, it is impossible to overcome these problems. Impunity frightens investments. And without investments, we are going not to have <coughs> revenues for funding all the social investment we need for our country to overcome poverty and for our country to have a fair income distribution. Mr. President, I'm also from Colombia, and I would like to know, you were talking about the, the problem we have with narco-traffic. So, even though we're negotiating a peace deal with, with FARC, we did that with the paramilitaries before, the, the real problem is the drug dealing in Colombia. And we can make deals with these groups and then new criminal bands are going to uh, show up because of the profitability of this business. What are the things that developed, and developed countries and Colombia and the region in, region in general have to do to Take, change the dynamic of this situation and take this problem to a different level. Look at this. FARC at this moment could have us, I have already said to you, over 8,000 members. The organizations known as BACRIM, criminal gangs, have the, roughly speaking, the same number. The organized crime mutuates. This is to highlight your introduction. Our government reduced uh, cocaine exports from Colombia from 1,000 tons per year to less than 200. The Colombian police has stated that if the year 2000, the number of hectares planted with coca leaves would have measured, would have been measured with the same technology of today, Colombia would have had more than 400,000 hectares of cocaine, of, of coca leaves. Officially speaking, with the technology of our times, of those times, during our administration, Colombia passed from having 100 
70,000 hectares to 67,000. I remember that many people told me, Mr. President, you are going to create a worse problem of rural unemployment because the more you eliminate illegal plantations, the more unemployment will be in the rural communities. First, to eliminate illicit drugs, we proceeded with spray, but at the same time, we introduced manual eradication. And we did our best to provide rural communities with uh, some crops, legal crops, to substitute coca and marijuana. And in those areas, Colombia is an Amazonic country. Keep in mind this. Colombia is a country with 1,140,000 square kilometers. 53% of our territory is still in rainforest. Our main contribution to the worldwide anti-climate change policy is to preserve our jungle. We have areas of the country where we cannot expand commercial agriculture. In those areas, we invited 90,000 rural families who were engaged in growing illicit drugs, and they came to terms with my administration to abandon illicit drugs, to collectively supervise that this area were kept free of illicit drugs and to supervise the rainforest recovery. And we pay to them a very small amount of, of money, but we pay to them. And it uh, worked. The United Nations released a report in which they said that this one an exemplary substitution crops substitution project in the region. My tale is to say this, my story. It is possible to find reasonable ways. For instance, we eliminate plantations, provide rural communities with alternative possibilities. Rural unemployment at the moment our administration began was around 14. Today is in between six and eight. It is clear that the more legal crops you expand, the better for rural communities. We extradited, roughly speaking, 1,200 kingpins, especially to the United States. In the last three years of our administration, we confiscated 17,000 properties in the hands of narco groups. Colombia has a very important, effective legislation to forfeit illegal wealth. We work a lot against money laundering. But at the same time, we introduce a constitutional amendment. This constitutional amendment has three points. Consumers should never be taken to jail, only to hospitals, to medical doctors. It is necessary to launch abundant policies of prevention. 
but traffickers and distributors should be taken to jail. My country advanced. If we, we didn't solve that, the problem. Yes, because you could say to me, but Mr. President, you failed. Because at the end of our UN administration, Colombia still exported 180 tons. But you have to see the movie, not only the photograph. Eight years before, Colombia exported 1,000 tons. We have not won, but we were winning. Therefore, I am convinced that this kind of project, when this kind of project uh, gain sustainability in the long, in the long term, what, uh, when they are over the changes from one president to the next president, it, uh, they produce excellent results. It is necessary to have continuity. I remember my professor, Michael Porter at Harvard, speaking on competitiveness. At the very beginning of the 90s, he said to us, you need to set your goals. You need to draw your way. And you need to improve your way every day, but not to abandon the way. I, uh, a question about leadership. So in, as president... Slowly, please. Sure. <laughs> uh, so my question is about leadership. And, and as president, you, know, you have the unique position of, of you have uh, your constituents, uh, both people who support you and don't. You have neighbors, other relations in Latin America, Brazil, Southern Cone. Um, you're obviously, you have the strong relationships with the, the United States and, and free trade. Um, and then, of course, UN and, and other organizations. Um, can you talk about some of the lessons you learned uh, about leadership and the various, the juggle of perspectives and, and how do you serve one group while maintaining the consequences or the, 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 the reactions that others, uh, you know, Venezuela or the United States or Brazil, and, and how did you, what, what, what lessons about leadership could you share for us uh, about the, those types of uh, very, groups you have to, to try to keep on your side and, and in support of your agenda? From the United States, what I learned is that it is very important to have a bipartisan policy in this country regarding Latin American countries. It should be no government-to-government uh, -government relationship. It should be a state-to-state -state relationship. In the case of Venezuela, Chavez, and Ecuador, Correa, I have been very severely criticized. And some of my critics say Uribe is very confrontational. He fought all the time with Chavez. Not all the time. <laughs> Not all the time. I spent, I spent six years of my administration with all the patience, trying to get along with President Chavez, but it was impossible. <laughs> he cheated me. And I have said to myself, foreign relations cannot be relations to hide heart problems. I had two options. One option was to be quite friendly with Chavez and to forget that Chavez was providing shelter to Colombian terrorists in Venezuela. And I said to myself, no. Colombians have the right that our neighbors uh, do not provide hideout to terrorist groups. Therefore, I made the decision to fight for the right. And of course, I believe in five democratic principles. 
security, freedoms. The freedom of private initiative is the only way for the fair democratic principle, social cohesion. Independent institutions and pluralistic people participation. And Chavez is creating a new Cuba with oil. And I have said, and I said to myself, why we as a neighbor country cannot denounce the danger for the region that derives for this new Cuba? And I denounce it. I remember, therefore, the lesson from Venezuela is this. In the name of good diplomatic relationships, you need to make all the efforts, but you can never become hypocrite. The lesson from Ecuador, I had no problem with President Gustavo Novoa, nor have I problems with his successor, Lucio Gutierrez and President Palacio. I remember that we arrested with the cooperation of President Palacio one of the kingpins of FARC in, in Quito. And uh, President Palacio sent him that uh, the same afternoon to my country. But with President Correa, we had a lot of problems. Because President Correa, in many occasions, expressed he applauded FARC. And I said, no. I cannot get along with President Correa regarding FARC the same we got along with his predecessors. For when we detected the presence of Raul Reyes in Ecuador, I had no option, no different option than bombing the jungle in Ecuador and uh, shooting down Raul Reyes. From the jungle in Ecuador, he killed Colombians. He was in control of the kidnap, kidnapping of Madame Betancourt, three Americans and many Colombians. Look at this. The day after the bombing, our army penetrated FARC without the interference of Reyes. And three months late, later, Madame Betancourt was released with three Americans without cheating one single drop of blood. Of course, we were careful to be certain that in the jungle, there were not civilian population. Only there was a campground of the terrorist group FARC. The day after, very early in the morning, I asked the Minister of Defense, Mr. Minister, in what is your guess how Colombians are going to perceive the outcome of this bombing? And his answer was, Mr. President, I agree with you. No killing is good killing. But Colombians will be happy because they know how dangerous was this terrorist. Mr. Minister, do you consider that this is good news? Yes, Mr. President, please. Go to the media and release this good news. Because my idea was, in every case of good news, as leader, you need to allow your colleagues for them to claim the good news. And he said to me, and what are you going to do? I will wait for Mr. Chavez's reaction. <laughs> and Mr. Chavez came with um, a harsh reaction. And I received a, a phone call from one outstanding Colombian politician. He told me, Mr. President, you are having very hard diplomatic problems with Mr. Chavez and Mr. Correa. 
the best way for you to overcome these diplomatic problems is to fire the commander of the Air Force. And my answer was never. Because maybe we are going to appease this diplomatic problem, but we are going to seed distrust in our armed forces. For that night, I said, my fellow Colombians, tomorrow the Minister of Defense gave us the good news of the bombing against the terrorist group led by Raul Reyes. And uh, along the day, we have had the bad news of the diplomatic conflict. And I am the only one accountable for these problems. Congratulations to the Air Force. And of course, I have to say to you that I am, I am the only one accountable, and I will do my best to get to goals, to fulfill two goals. First, that no, no country hides Colombian terrorists, and that we find out any way to overcome this diplomatic quarrel. Three months later, we rescued Madame Betancourt. Be hours before launching the military operation, I was asked by the minister and the commander of the military forces, Mr. President, there is a risk that once our helicopter be landed on the jungle, far can uncover our trick. And do not allow Madame Betancourt to get on board of the helicopter. And I said, what is your recommendation? We need to leave her move backward to the jungle. Never, my friends. We need a B plan. How, Mr. President? It, it, it would be dangerous. I will be the only one accountable. And because I had fulfilled my, my promise, my pledge of being accountable, accountable, and be, of being the only one accountable in every difficult moment, they trusted in me. And we created plan B that was unnecessary to be applied. And when I saw the minister one and a half hour after the release of Madame Betancourt, he said to me, Mr. with the military commanders, Mr. President, are you going to receive Madame Betancourt? No, minister. It is good news for your political future. The best is that you go there and you show up before the media. And tomorrow we need to see you in the front pages of the newspapers with Madame Betancourt for your political future. <laughs> Therefore, in this, in this case, there are very important lessons. One lesson of leadership in these cases is that you need to persevere in moments of difficulties. This uh, happy rescue took place in July 2008. But in May 2003, we failed in attempting to rescue 11 Colombians. Two of them, the governor of our province, and one former Minister of Defense, who were loved by Colombians. Nine out of the 11 hostages were killed, including the minister and the governor. And the members of my team asked this question, what are we going to say? My answer, it had no discussion what is true. Who is the only one accountable? Hey, and what about responsibilities? 
And I said, I am the only one accountable. We went to the jungle. We registered some details of the episode. At evening, we went to the hospital. I spoke with the two survivors. They told me about details. At that, at I, I, I told the commander of the army, General, it is our turn. Please, we need to have the maps on this screen. And we are going to tell Colombians what really has happened. That night, Colombians uh, became divided and united. Divided, because many said, we disagree with President Uribe's decision to carry on military rescues. Another said the opposite. We agree with these attempts. But they became united because nobody could said that we had lied to the country. We said what it was true. But for you students, what is my experience? When my government detected corruption, when my government recognized problems, when we express to the people what problems we had, we were applauded and supported by the public opinion. But when my government did not detect corruption, and instead was accepting cases of corruption at the right time, some ministers assumed the stand of defensiveness. We were punished by the public opinion. For leadership, it is very important to detect your problems and to deliver your problems to the public, to the, your constituency, to your teams on the right time, to assume responsibilities, to say, I am accountable, and to invite people to look for, for ways to, to correct the problems. Many lessons, my friend. Uh, my name is Gonzalo Serrano, I'm from Chile. Uh, I would like to ask you about ways to improving public education. I would like to ask you if you can tell us one thing that you would do to improve uh, the education at the preschool level, kindergarten, one thing that you would do to improve education at the school level, and one thing at the university level. Okay. <laughs> Now I notice that you are no journalist. <laughs> you are um, MBA students. <laughs> because every question needs a very uh, deep answer. We work, coverage, quality, technology, R&D, vocational training, and relevance. Second, in the 100 years before our administration, Colombia had had, pay the attention, in 100 years, 126 ministers of education. We had only one minister. After our administration, she was appointed uh, at Harvard University as professor, and now she has uh, come back to the country to be the president of one very outstanding university. <clears throat> For those under five, it is necessary to correct problems of malnutrition. The, it is the first priority in countries such as Colombia. And we advance a lot in this. For those from the poorest families, to engage them in the special education they need because of their age, we were in need of creative, 
creating two million places. We only created 400,000. We have a lot of shortages. In primary education, coverage pass from 78 to 100%. In secondary middle education, coverage passed from 58 to 80. In university, coverage passed from 22 to 36. In vocational training, I want not to exaggerate, but Colombia is now the leading country in the region. There is one institution, its name is National Service or Apprenticeship. It is funded by employers. They pay a tax of two percentual points on the payrolls. And this institution is managed in coordination of government, employers, and employees. It's open to the public, and it's free. We pass from training one million workers per year to training eight million. And one very important reform we introduce is the integration between the technological level and the university level. If you graduate as technician, for instance, in IT, later on you can go to the university to complete your credits and to have access to the graduation as an IT engineer. For quality, we introduced many reforms to choose professors on the base of merit. You cannot imagine how difficult it was. Second, we adopted two frameworks of salaries for professors. A better one for those, the new ones, engage on merit, and the old system for those that have been chosen before, and, and those who want not to update in their skills. We examine professors quite often. Have you, uh, and, and we introduce exams for students all along the, the years of education, not only for high school graduates. And for university students, we introduce exams for graduates. And we release the results of these exams. For Colombian to know, this year, what is the best MBA? What is the best school for chemistry? What is the best school for economics? And who are the best graduates? And to create relevance between the educational offer and the necessities of the economy, we establish what I call the observatory labs to do follow-up to the graduate students and to know how they perform once graduated. And we made the results of these labs quite often. What I would do at this moment, first, to create much more integration between the private and the public sector. To know with much more accuracy what is necessary for today and for tomorrow. 
And second, in this uh, joint action, in this public-private joint action, to agree on this, we need to provide uh, students, young graduates, with opportunities for them to undertake uh, enterprises. We support though, that we have provided them with education, but we have to put in their hands what I call the tools of the market economy. If you are a member of one investment bank and you are asked to put money for funding enterprises, starting enterprises by youngsters, you would say, no, I cannot. This is quite risky. But if the government calls in a public bid for investment banks, for them to manage fiscal resources assigned by the government, for the, and to assign the resources for funding these star, starting enterprises, it would work. Did we do this? Yes, but very small. In Latin America today, we have youngsters unemployment in between 18 and 21. In Spain, in the year 2007, it was the level. But today, in Spain, they have over 54. Latin America is a region with a 600 million people, very young people. I am adding the Caribbean. The average age is 20, 27. For we have to be aware of our challenges. And the main challenge is to give answers to the expectation of our young people and to say to them, here you have educational and financial possibilities for you to undertake enterprises. Um, good afternoon. Here. <laughs> uh, okay, I'd like to ask you two things. Um, one, uh, regarding the defense, South American Defense Council, one of its goals is to have to, to foster a defense industry in the region. And I think that can only be achieved if Colombia, Brazil, and Argentina have a strong cooperation because they have the most developed industries. So I'd like to have your thoughts on that. And second, uh, when we talk about reforming the UN Security Council, um, Brazil is very keen to try to have this leading role in representing South America. Argentina clearly like, opposes to that. But considering that Colombia may overcome Argentina very soon, I would also like to have your thoughts on the legitimacy of that claim. Argentina is very rich. No government has been able to take Argentina to bankruptcy. <laughs> so far. Look at this, while Colombia has almost uh, 700,000 uh, hectares of top soil, Argentina has 30 million. While Colombia, with uh, 47 million people, produces uh, 28 million tons of food per year, Argentina this year could produce 100 million tons of grains. These simple measures give you a clear idea of how rich is Argentina. Colombia had an economy unilaterally open. 
My predecessors had opened our market, but without agreements. We had only one agreement with the Indian community and one second very light agreement with Mexico. We negotiated many trade agreements, one agreement between Mercos, uh, with Mercosur. And this agreement has created enormous possibilities for Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, and for Mercosur. Argentina used to export to Colombia no more than $200 million. Large year, almost $2 billion. Of course, it is necessary to develop strategic alliances. And what could be the alliance you refer to? My main concern is that Argentina needs much more investment confidence. And Colombia needs not to lose that high level of investment confidence the country has gained in the last years. With the integration and investment confidence and advancing in education, it is possible to move forward with the developments of this case of this kind of alliances as you refer to. Um, President Uribe, I'm Martin from Peru. Um, let's look at Latin America. It's a very hot topic in the business world due to our economic growth in the last years. Um, what do you think are the main challenges and opportunities of Latin America in the next 10 to 20 years to sustain this uh, economic growth? For instance, in the economy, look at this. Latin America is very dependable on the commodities-based economy. I won't say that we need to resign to, the, to commodities, but we need to figure out how to add value. Mexico is doing the best in the region for adding value to the economy. Possibilities and challenges. For the year, uh, 2030, the United Nations Organization for Food has anticipated that the world will need to increase supply by 50%. Latin America has almost 25% of the worldwide arable land. 26% the beef supply. There are many countries in the world that cannot extend, expand the size of the land dedicated to agriculture. Latin America can do this. Besides that, at that time we need to increase supply by 50%. There is a new limitation the decrease in productivity because of the climate change. Look at this. You need to increase supply, and you need to confront a decrease, probably, of 25% in productivity. In my opinion, there are many countries that cannot increase supply. And the only way to offset the limitation is by countries, such as the Latin American countries, to increase supply in every country above 50%. With investment confidence, with R&D, and with respect for the environmental rules, 
Argentina could pass from 100 million tons to 200. Brazil, from 170 to almost 400. Colombia could reach 60, 60, 60 million tons per year. This is a great possibility and a great challenge. Energy. By the year 2030, the world will need to increase the supply of energy by 40%. In the region, we have 10% of the world oil reserves. 6% of the natural gas world reserves. We have all the possibility for renewable energy. For instance, Colombia did not produce one single gallon of biofuels 10 years ago. And now it's the second in the region in ethanol from sugar cane after Brazil. And the first in the region in biodiesel from palm oil. And in the region we have two advantages to advance in biofuels. One, we have land to expand the production of biofuels without cutting the jungle down. And second, without competing with food security. You cannot expand the production of biofuels at the expenses of food security. Latin America could keep these two standards. And at the same time, we have possibilities in geothermal energy, possibilities of solar energy, possibilities of eolic energy. Other enormous possibilities, the supply of potable water. Look at this. By the same year, 2030, the world will need an increase in the supply of potable water by 30%. Latin America and the Caribbean, they have 55% of the worldwide reserves of potable water. But at the same time, we have 57% of the primary forest, 5-7. And at the same time, 26% of the biodiversity. Look at the Amazon basin alone. Therefore, we need a challenge. We need to meet this challenge. How to fulfill our obligation to contribute to the world to attend the necessity to increase water supply by 40%, and at the same time, how to make these sources sustainable by paying all the attention to preservation. Of course, I cannot forget the rule of law. For Latin America to work in the coming years, I consider that Latin America needs to war with security, freedom, social cohesion, independent institutions, and pluralistic people participation. These, these are some of the reasons of my criticism to Castro, Chavez, in some degree, Curtin Correa, Morales, and the Nicaragua government, not to mention others. Colombia, and on a similar matter, I would like to know your opinion about the strengths and the weaknesses of Colombian environmental policies, especially on the matter of protecting our natural resources. Slowly, please, slowly. <laughs> especially on the matter of protecting our natural resources in issues like the Paramo of San Turban or like the construction of uh, Mina La Colosa, and especially now with so many companies coming to the country um, to invest.
Colombia has a clear environmental legislation. Of course, Colombia is very rich in uh, potential mining. And because of the price of gold, and because of security, and the right conditions to promote investment, many mining company, corporations have come to Colombia. My opinion is that we need a balance between the necessity of our country to move forward with mines and at the same time to preserve the environment. For instance, in the high land of Santurban, this is a, a source of, for water. In the legislation, this is a clear area of reserve. Therefore, we cannot allow the corporation uh, to, to mine in there. In, in La Colosa, it is in El Tolima, there has been a very strong discussion. The people living in the neighborhood, they say, we need this mine. This will be our source for jobs. And the people living in the flatland say, we cannot, because this mine could hurt our source of water, and we cannot lose our, our, our water. Therefore, my recommendation to my fellow Colombians is we can fulfill our environmental obligations and at the same time to open ways for mining in our country. What my administration did was to have permanent public hearings with communities. I remember that I went to La Jagua and El Cesar, to La Loma and El Cesar, during our Saturday community meetings. And in one public square, we convened the mayors, the governors, the managerial team of the corporation, the unions, the communities, and I said, here, I do not accept violence because of the tradition of violence in my country. Violent groups uh, intercepted, penetrated these communities to take advantage of the discussion on mining, or on mines. I said, no violence, but we need to agree. And after long days of permanent discussion, public open discussion, we reached agreements, and we did follow up of how these agreements, uh, how, this, uh, how people were fulfilling these agreements. What I have said today is, I disagree that the terror group FARC be the representative of the communities of these areas. What we need is that the government goes there and promote discussions, and makes all the efforts to reach agreements. When I look at the faces of the young people on these topics, as an old man, as a grandfather that I am, my recommendation is no fundamentalism, rational the balanced combination between the environ, environment and the mining sector is possible. President. Uribe, um, how do you believe, do you believe that uh, Venezuela's uh, recent joinment in Mercosur could help uh, in any way that the leaders of the other Mercosur countries uh, affect President Chavez's radicalism? Do you think that by any chance they could uh, help decrease it? And in a second instance, uh, what, do you, what uh, policies and institutions do you believe 
that have proven to be successful in, in Colombia's recent, uh, recent years? And what, what do, what, how do you think that other Latin American countries could imitate these policies and institutions to gain development? In theory, the presence of Venezuela in Mercosur could be considered the right way to stop the Chavez radicalism. But, unfortunately, Mercosur, in some cases, has demonstrated that instead of fighting for the compliance of the law, they want to be complacent with the whims of some of the caudillos. If Mercosur standed for the law, it would, very, it would be very convenient to stop Chavez radicalism. If Mercosur standed as it stands today for the caudillos, nothing will happen in Venezuela. What are the institutions? Security, freedoms. I remember that in the 80s, Castro said, we need a socialist country in the region with oil. And this should be Venezuela. In my opinion, if I were asked, has Chavez done something good? I have to say yes. Because he, have, he has implemented misiones for the poorest people. And Capriles did good because Capriles said to the Buddhist people, if I win, I will preserve missiones for you. What is my main difference with Chavez? He uses missiones to manipulate voters. And missiones, in my opinion, are not sustainable, regardless of oil. If you look at the microeconomic, macroeconomic indicators of Venezuela, you see that they are worsening because of the lack of private investment. Four, in my five parameters, in my five democratic parameters, the second is freedoms, the third is social cohesion. In my opinion, with the lack of freedom of investment, that is the case of Venezuela, Chavez is on the way to expropriate the private sector and no socialist in the, no socialism in the world has succeeded because they annul the creativity. And this is the case of Venezuela. This has been the case of Cuba. Cuba has been a failure. Cuba has survived only for two subsidies. First, the Soviet subsidy and recently, the Venezuelan subsidy. Venezuela is very rich in, in, in oil, but because of the lack of private investment, I believe that Venezuela cannot make sustainable the missiones of Chavez. Third, if you have a nation with a prosperous economy, but you are not making progress in the social chapter, people will react. And people would say, I do not matter that, that this economy is growing faster because I am living in very poor conditions. Therefore, you need this simultaneity between the promotion of investment and the advancing in social cohesion. In the middle of many economic crises during our eight years, 13 million Colombians left out poverty. They are necessary to take hands to hands promotion of investment and at the same time the advancement in social cohesion. Of course, for you to invest in one country, you need security, you need legal security, you need incentives, and you need political security. For you need the four element, 
solid, independent institutions. And you need ways for you to complain. And if the government crack down the freedom of expression, Chavez, the, the government of Venezuela nowadays owns over 57% of the media. Therefore, every day, there are less possibilities for you to, comp to, to freely co complain in Venezuela. And you would say, I cannot invest because, because I don't have ways to deliver my complaints. It's very important to have legal security. During our administration, one law was enacted, a law allowing the government to sign pacts for stability in the rules for 20 years with investors. It has been very important. At the same time, we need political security. Look at this. In one country, you wake up. And at the moment you begin thinking what to do in the day, the first nightmare that comes to your mind is this. This government likes to expropriate private investors. Who is the next that this government will expropriate? In this country, there is no political security. On the other hand, there is a country where the government, the public opinion, both are likely to promote private investors with social responsibility. You see that there is a political framework for security. And of course, it is necessary to introduce incentives. Our idea was not to lower taxes to the wealthiest of the country. All the opposite. We levy taxes to them for them to pay security. But we created incentives for investment. I remember one case, one law we enacted said this. When you invest $1 in Colombia, you have the right for a tax deduction of 30 cents. One thing is to lower taxes to the wealthiest. Another very different thing is to promote investment. If you want to have wealth in the country for the government to take more revenues, you need to create wealth. For, for us, it was very important to have this promotion, plus free trade agreements, plus coordination between the government and the private sector to choosing what are the sectors this country can become a worldwide player. Plus, how to increase com competitiveness every year. I remember at the, at the beginning in the doing business of the World Bank, Colombia had the pos what, position 78 or 80. In the last year of our administration, our position was 37. And Colombia was the leader in the Latin American region. Today is the third one. There are many possibilities for you to increase investment in one country. But consider, politically speaking, investment is not the end. Investment is a mean to create social cohesion. I have the hope that you were going a journalist with close questions. And I want not to, I want not to surpass Chavez in long speeches. <laughs> President Uribe, um, first of all, thank you very much. I absolutely love the country. I'm American, uh, but married a Colombian from Medellin. And from Medellin. I'd like to say I'm a very proud gringo paisa. <laughs> Muchas gracias. And there's so much opportunity. When I go to Colombia, what I see are so many resources, including the people. Very first time there, I saw a man pushing an ice cream cart up the mountain, out of the city, towards the airport. Such industriousness in the people. And what I'm wondering is, 
around here, all of these young, ambitious folks who are studying business, what kinds of things in terms of bringing the departments of commerce closer together between our two countries, what kinds of things can be done that would promote better cohesion between the growing Colombian economy as a leader in Latin America and this very large economy here? There has been one great step, the negotiation and the ratification of the free trade agreement. But as, a, as the young lady asked me about the possibility of bilateral agreements between Colombia and Argentina, the United States and Colombia, the United States and Peru, could determine which set, sectors to develop jointly. For instance, we have enormous of possibilities of biofuels. Here, if you want to dedicate corn for ethanol, you have to limit corn for people. In Colombia, we can expand land for sugar cane for ethanol, and, and at the same time, land for corn for people. I have seen that the basket energy in the United States has improved a lot. But I wanted that the United States moves forward in joint action with uh, Latin American countries, in this case with my country. In coordination with the private sector, our administration chose some sectors in which Colombia could become a worldwide player, biofuels, hospitals. Before the critical years of violence, we receive a lot of patients from Central America and from the Caribbean. Medical doctors, Colombian medical doctors, are, they have a, an excellent reputation. We introduced as incentive for Colombia to develop a state of the art hospitals. The production of medicines, of cosmetics, business process outsourcing. Colombia is doing well in this. Colombia has passed from 3,000 jobs in this sector, and today it is over, I think, over 75,000 direct jobs in this sector. It, is, it would be very convenient to identify specific sectors and to join together. For instance, we need a strategic alliance between the Cleveland Clinic and the Colombian hospitals, the Mayo Clinic and the Colombian hospitals, to provide services in Colombia not only for, for Colombians, but for the people from Central America, from the Caribbean, etc. There are many possibilities. But in my opinion, these possibilities do not depend on the government. In the, it, they depend on the new leaders. And here, today at lunch, I said to some of my, of these John MBA who attended the lunch with me, I no longer agree that there is a difference between managers and leaders. Every leader to get things done should be a good manager. And every manager to have sustainable long-term successes should be a great leader. For my confidence is in the new leaders, and here you have many. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez, for joining us today. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
on behalf of the Latin American Student Association at FUQA, Rafael and I would like to thank you uh, for giving us the honor of visiting us today. It's an honor to have a leader with your experience comment about the political and economic situation of Latin America. I'm sure all of us have gotten great insight about everything you have taught us today. Um, thank you for being a good friend to the Duke community. And as a token of our appreciation, we would like to give you two gifts to remember us once you're back in Colombia. Gold Standard by Coach K, um, and a book signed by Professor Don Arelli. Both of these have a personal message from them to you. Muchas gracias a todos ustedes. Ha sido un gran honor para mí. Y recuerden, en las manos de ustedes hay muchos futuros de este país. Gracias, Dean and Associate Dean. Gracias, Manuel y jóvenes. Todos muchas gracias. One more time, thank you for being here and good luck in all your future endeavors. Furthermore, we would like to thank all the people that have helped us at putting this event together. Uh, first of all, with the FUQA leadership, Dean Bill Balding, Ross Morgan, and Patrick Dottie, uh, the Corporate Relations Office, directed by Stephen Windham, and the International Programs Office, directed by Bertrand Iutin, Kevin Anselmo, and Erin Medin for, from FUQA PR. And secondly, the LASA cabinet for the counselors' hours in planning the, the event, and finally, all the attendants of the event today for taking time uh, to learn about Latin America and Colombia. To continue learning about Latin America, we would like everyone to our symposium that's gonna be next Wednesday, 14th at 8 a.m. We'll be sharing uh, a lot of leadership experiences, such as this one, uh, and so please make sure you mark your, your calendars for this big event. And finally, books could be, uh, Mr. Uribe, he's also a book author, uh, Books can be pre-ordered here on stage at the end of this presentation. The cost is only $20. And we currently don't have any books because of the Sandy logistics. But if you purchase them, if you pre-order them, you will receive a signed bookmark by President Oribe. You could pick the books next uh, week, uh, Thursday and Friday in the Fox Center. Uh, we will be uh, distributing, distributing them accordingly. All proceeds are going to go to Mr. Oribe's university, He's starting a project next uh, well, in the following years, about uh, I didn't know that <laughs> the, book, <laughs> the book did almost perish because of Sandy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so on behalf of the Latin American Student Association, thank you all for being here. Thank you for taking the time and hope to see you soon next week. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.